Hello, my name's Richard Felix and I'm going to take you on a tour of Haunted Hampshire. Some of the stories that you're going to hear are to do with ghosts, real ghosts, entities, spirits and souls that for whatever reason are still trapped on this earth having unfinished business and are waiting to be sent or helped to go to wherever good souls should go. Others, I believe, are nothing more than a recording. They are to do with tragic, traumatic, premature death, such as murders, suicides, executions, accidents, and of course, battles. Their time hadn't come, and the energy used by the body and the brain in resisting death can be so immense that I believe that the actual event just before death can be recorded into the fabric of a building. Stone, bricks, mortar, the soil, and possibly even into the woodwork. And what better place to start this tour of Haunted Hampshire than here in Portsmouth, which has been a naval base certainly since the time of King Henry VIII. And here, of course, is the Mary Rose, HMS Warrior, and of course, the Victory. There is only one ghost concerned with HMS Victory, and that is of a young boy in an officer's uniform that's seen on many occasions walking down the gangplank and disappearing somewhere in the vicinity of this car. And yet when you think of the amount of death and pain that must have gone on within that ship, then it's very surprising that there aren't even more ghosts. And at the Battle of Trafalgar, when Nelson was killed, there were also 57 sailors killed with him. But of course, Portsmouth does have many ghosts. In the churchyard of St. Peter and St. Paul, and in the old Swan Inn. So why not come and join me? Turn down the lights, give me a full attention, and let me take you on a tour of Haunted Hampshire. I'm in the little churchyard of St. Peter and St. Paul, the church across the road from me here just outside Portsmouth and there's a ghost in this graveyard the ghost of a lady in white that has been seen both in the churchyard and also wandering along the roadway and disappearing into the church but most times she's seen it's actually in the graveyard and she's seen day and night wandering amongst these graves and every so often she stops stoops and looks at the inscriptions on the grave no one knows why that ghost still haunts this graveyard all they know is that people do still see her here on the outskirts of Portsmouth. What she's waiting for, who she's looking for, no one knows. But perhaps one day, someone will be able to come here to help her, to send her towards the light, to release her from the torment that she must be in, being earthbound when she should have been sent away to a better place. And here we are in the haunted Swan pub on Copner Road in Portsmouth. This place is haunted by the ghost of either a barmaid or a waitress that co-owned this building with her sailor husband. They had, for want of a better word, a drunken row in the 1880s 
and the husband battered her to death with a poker, more or less in front of this fire. And it's triggered off quite an amount of activity, ghostly activity. This, of course, was a murder, but it hasn't caused a recording to take place. This is, this is a real ghost. This is a poltergeist. Now, poltergeists, you don't see them very often. You hear them and you feel them. They move things, they throw things, and they make noises, rappings, tappings. And this ghost here has been quite active, moving things around. Pictures, for absolutely no reason at all, come off the wall. But when they come off the wall, they don't break. It's as if the ghost has actually picked them up, taken them off, and placed them on the floor. Sometimes they're turned round the other way. Obviously, the ghost doesn't like some of the pictures that they've got here in the pub. And they were telling me also this afternoon that one gentleman, a customer standing at the bar with a full pint of beer, and all of a sudden there was an almighty bang and his glass blew up, his pint pot blew up like a laminated windscreen, just tiny, tiny little particles of glass. That was all that was left. In fact, they said to me, even the base was gone. Now, poltergeists use energy, but they use the energy from people, from us. They occupy the mind of an owner and use the energy from that person. And it's usually children, especially girls in adolescence and then as those girls sort of grow up the ghost just leaves them disappears now whether that's what it is here I know there are a couple of young barmaids here who were this afternoon whether that's anything to do with it no one really knows but all we know is that that troubled woman that was battered to death here in the Swan Inn still haunts this area of the bar and especially the area around here where the murder took place. I presume that she died more or less on this spot here in Portsmouth in the 1880s. Behind me here, this absolutely magnificent view of Portsmouth and the harbour. What an incredible place, up here on top of the hills, to perhaps build a fort. But no, they actually built three forts here in the late 1850s, early 1860s, to combat the threat of invasion by the Emperor of France, Napoleon III. And this is one of the three forts, Fort Purbrook completely preserved as it was, open to the public and an activity centre in it at the moment, but there's more activity in there because it's haunted, it's got ghosts. So why not come inside and join me on a ghostly tour in the tunnels underneath Fort Purbrook at Portsmouth. This is probably the longest tunnel that I've ever been in in my life. I'm right underneath the chalk escarpment above Portsmouth in the tunnels, one of the many tunnels underneath Fort Purbrook. These would be communication tunnels used in case the fort was under attack. They would also be used for conveying ammunition. There'd be big cannons here and of course mortars and the, I would imagine that the ammunition would also be trundled along these tunnels. Now this fort and all the tunnels that are underneath were built by civilians here in the late 1850s, 1860s and they were supervised by sappers, by soldiers from the Royal Engineers to make sure if you like, that they were doing the job properly. 
and there is a ghost story more or less in this area where we are now of a young Royal Engineer, probably a corporal, that was supervising the workers in this very spot where I'm standing now and the roof caved in and as you can see on both sides here it's, it's chalk um, and it, you can see where it's literally been hacked out by the pigs and of course on this side here it's also chalk but here this little bit, only this bit, has been redone and bricked and his ghost has been seen wandering along these tunnels and I've been in lots of places I'm obviously doing a, a national ghost tour of Great Britain it's pretty obvious that I'm going to go into spooky places and I have been into a few but I've never had a feel like I've got down here. I, we actually toyed with the idea of doing it without the lights and just using the lights of the, of the camera, but no, I wouldn't do it uh, because there is a real damp chill about, especially this area where I am now. And um, apparently a medium was brought down here and she got as far as here and they did it without lights, just, just with torches and she said, I can sense there's something here, there's, there's a presence of someone here. And there's also, she said, at some time, there's a spiral staircase. And of course, there is. And again, there's such a, an icy chill about this area here. And of course, it's all to do with energy. And you see, if a, if a ghost or a spirit is wanting to, to, to materialise in front of you, it needs energy. And when it hasn't got any, it needs to get the energy from somewhere to draw it to itself. And of course, heat is energy. And so the entity draws the heat from an area like this to itself and appears, which causes it to be able to materialize. And then, of course, that's why you get a cold spot. People say frequently, oh, the temperature dropped. And then this figure appeared. And it uses that heat, that energy, and when it's used it up, it's a bit like pulling out a 13 amp plug. What does it do? It vaporizes, it just vanishes. And of course the temperature returns. But there is a real ice chill to this area here. And I was talking earlier to one of the guides on the phone, it's his day off unfortunately today, a chap called Brian, and he said that he was actually coming down this tunnel with two teenage girls and they were going to do some of the, they do a lot of climbing here, shooting and various other activities. And he was walking down with the girls, as they were walking down here, just about this area where I, I'm standing now, and I'm looking around all the time just in case, um, they saw a figure of a person standing here and they stopped up there and they said, oh, oh it must be one of the other guides. And of course Brian knew full well that there was no one else here. But as they got closer towards him, they noticed that the chap standing here had got a uniform on. And Brian, of course, realised that he was seeing the ghost of that young Royal Engineer soldier that was crushed to death here. And he said to me, he'd never had two little girls grab hold of his hands so tightly. And he said, we both all three of us turned and beat a hasty retreat back to the doors. And he said, I took them back to their mums and dads. And then I came back and checked. And I switched the lights off. And I locked him in for the night. But farther down here at the very end is another area where there's also a haunting. It's called Piccadilly Circus. So we'll wander down this way and have a look. It's uh, not good this because the lights are fine here but um, as I get farther I've noticed that this is actually the last electric light here. Doesn't it echo down here? What we could do with these tunnels in Derby. Now it's getting a bit darker. Room off here and there's little rooms and alcoves all over the place down here. 
Another one here. You never know what you're going to see. Nothing in there. Another tunnel here. Going off again and disappearing through there. No wonder there are stories in a place like this. Staircase here. And right at the bottom here. The end of the tunnel. It goes no farther. And they tell me that this is the area that someone came that was coming shooting. He brought his greyhound dog down here and it wouldn't go any farther, it stopped. And all the hackles on its back came up and there was no way they could induce it to go any farther. So what is through that wall there? Nobody knows, but I'm certainly not staying to find out. Just in case this light gives out, we'll go back this way. And it really is rather nice, it's a long way down there, to come out of here, through the doors here. And this area here is, of course, the original area that they call Piccadilly Circus. Because the tunnels run off at angles from here. And here, this absolutely, magnificently spooky looking spiral staircase where again a man has been seen walking slowly up the spiral staircase and disappearing halfway up never to be seen again and this area that I'm coming out to now is the Redan, or in English, part of the castle keep. And it's haunted again. There's a little girl, a poltergeist, that haunts this area and parts of the fort. And in the 1880s, she was playing up on the top of the parapets. She was unaccompanied. She slipped and fell to her death, 40 feet down onto this area here and Brian again was telling me today the number of occasions that he has sensed that that little girl's with him when he's wandering around the place guiding people he hears a singing he hears a voice and he says the number of times that lights go out when there's no one there to turn them off and also the number of times that he actually hears doors opening and closing when he knows that he is actually the only living person in this fort. This is Southampton General Hospital and of course it's haunted otherwise we wouldn't be here now of course with the amount of death that goes on in hospitals then of course they have to be haunted they have to have some ghosts um, this place actually occupies the site of an old Victorian workhouse which was known as the borough and it was administered by nuns and they tended to the sick as well and of course people that had nowhere to go were put here and folks even in those days that were dying were also put here one day a young novice nun administered some medicine to one of the very sick patients it was the wrong medicine it was poisonous and she died the nun was so distressed that she actually committed suicide by taking some of the same medicine her ghost still haunts 
the area of this hospital. And in 1972, a young lady that had had a car accident was here, recovering from her accident, was lying awake, she couldn't sleep, waiting for morning to come. She could hear the moaning and the sighing of some of the other patients in the ward. She was just starting to become drowsy when, to her shock and horror, at the bottom of her bed stood two figures. Two figures looking almost the same and they looked as if they were wearing some form of ecclesiastical clothing, cloaked and a cassock of some sort. She was quite frightened. She pressed the buzzer to fetch one of the night nurses. But before the nurse came, the two figures just disappeared. When the nurse did come, this lady asked who were the visitors that had come in. And of course the nurse said, there were no visitors, my dear, not at this time of night. The lady described the two figures and the nurse allayed her fears a little bit. She told her that it was probably the ghost of the nun and her victim that had often been seen together. But she said they looked the same, they looked like twins. And apparently it was common practice in those days for any of the patients that could walk around to help the nuns. And because there was a shortage of dressing gowns, the nuns would lend them their own habits and so of course they'd look the same hence the fact that those two figures standing at the bottom of the bed looked exactly the same but the nurse also said don't worry they appear to one or two people but they only appear to people that are going to get well which was quite a relief to the lady but of course there have been lots of other stories here um, one of a a grey nun that actually stands at the side of the bed but she always looks small and there was one gentleman who was rather ill in the night and this nun came to him and the following morning he said to the day staff who was the nun that came to me in the night the little nun she was so good to me and of course the staff said there were no nuns here and there isn't a little one. And in fact, they believe the reason that the nun looked small was because the floor had changed dramatically in the hundred years since the original building was put here. I've also spoken to one or two of the nurses here and they tell me that, of course, as the nun and her friend, if you like, appeared at the bottom of the bed to the lady that was getting better, they've said, of course, on quite a few occasions, they know when certain people are going to die because they say that their loved ones actually come to them and stand at the foot of their beds as if to tell them that it's time to take them away. Now, would nurses, rational nurses, really make up stories like that? No, I don't think so. But I think that sort of thing happens quite frequently in places like that when their loved ones actually come to fetch them. And I think it's quite a reassuring thought, don't you? I'm inside the magnificent Norman Cathedral of Winchester. Winchester was once the capital of England. St. Swithin was buried here. And then in the 11th century, his skull was taken to Canterbury. One of his arms was taken to Peterborough. And another arm taken to a church in Norway. No wonder with so much history here that there are ghostly monks around. And there is the ghost of a monk that has been seen wandering along these corridors, but then mounting steps 
which are no longer there. What happened to this monk, no one knows. Perhaps he was killed, robbed, murdered, and the tragedy or the trauma of his death, for some reason, has been recorded into the very stonework of this building. There was many years a programme on television called The Stone Tapes, and it's believed that a specially stone contains certain properties similar to recording tapes. And then either on the anniversary of the death, or if the atmosphere is similar, then that recording is played again, always in the same position. So, of course, those steps that were once there have been removed. That ghostly monk is, of course, still mounting them. And many years ago, an American tourist taking a photograph here of the altar noticed when she had it developed that there were in fact 13 ghostly monks standing motionless at the altar here in Winchester Cathedral. And this is believed to be the area where St Swithin was buried, somewhere near this original old archway. Of course, his, his head was sent to Canterbury, one arm to Norway and one arm to Peterborough Cathedral. I wonder if that's why, because his body was dismembered, that that ghostly monk has been seen wandering around the confines of Winchester Cathedral and wandering through this very archway here. And now a brief respite in the centre of Winchester outside the old Eclipse Inn. This was the scene of a rather horrendous execution in 1685. After the Duke of Monmouth's abortive attempt to take the throne back from his uncle, King James II, who was a Catholic, after the Battle of Sedgemoor, many rebels, of course, were hunted down, captured and hanged, drawn and quartered on the orders of Judge Jeffreys, the hanging judge. A local lady called Lady Lyle actually gave two rebels shelter in her house. They were captured and she was arrested and tried here in Winchester. And she was sentenced by Judge Jeffreys to be burnt at the stake for high treason. This was a dreadful, dreadful form of execution. You were drawn on a hurdle, which was a wooden sledge, from the prison to the place of execution, tied to a stake and burnt alive. This lady was 71 years of age and people petitioned Judge Jeffreys to behead her instead of burning her. And the king actually stepped in and wrote a letter to Judge Jeffreys telling him that Lady Lyle should be beheaded. They took her here to the eclipse and she spent her last night on this earth in that bedroom up there. A scaffold was erected outside this very inn with a block and an axe. Sawdust was strewn all over the scaffold. And on that fateful morning, Lady Lyle stepped out through that window onto the scaffold and was beheaded by Jack Ketch, one of the most famous executioners that England has ever known. Her ghost has been in seen inside the building. A grey lady has been seen. But also, people staying here over the years have heard the sound of knocking, as if someone was building a wooden structure outside their bedroom window. And it's believed that that tapping and knocking is in fact a ghostly reenactment of that dreadful scaffold being built here in front of this very building.
and coming up the stairs of the eclipse as Lady Lyle would have done of course to the room where she was kept before being executed and of course as I've mentioned in the video and others before I think executions especially being such a tremendously traumatic and horrendous death means that the event possibly just before death can actually be encapsulated, recorded into the fabric and with having such old oak here of course I think it probably holds that recording which of course is seen over and over again in the corridors here and behind me an old painting of the building and the scaffold was erected in front of that and Lady Lyle stepped out onto the scaffold through that very window there and I've gained entry I'm upstairs in the old original corridors and it's these corridors where a grey lady has been seen wandering she's always wearing a knitted grey dress lots of people living here landlords and staff have reported seeing this lady one lady one day coming out of the toilets which are up here saw this lady in grey coming towards her and then she disappeared the following morning she was in this corridor again and she saw the ghost for a second time but this time it actually came right up to her and brushed against her she actually felt this ghost touch her and then it continued off and disappeared through the wall when Lady Lyle was executed she was kept for the last night in the room here the doors locked and the landlord unfortunately isn't here but there is just rather conveniently a little stall and there's a window and I can actually see in and right through to the window where her ladyship stepped out onto the scaffold be executed here in this very inn in 1685 I'm in the high street in the centre of Alton we're on our way to the church and the graveyard but behind me here the old Crown Hotel and I have it on very good authority that it's got no less than four ghosts so why not join me for a drink Apparently, there's at least four ghosts in here. The landlord has been very helpful. He's brought me out all these books. Haunted Inns of Hampshire, Haunted Places of Hampshire, Ghosts of Hampshire, and of course the crown features in all of them. It's got at least four ghosts. Two men, a lady, and a dog. Let's deal with the dog first. A gentleman drinking at the bar hundreds of years ago left his dog lying by the fire the dog wouldn't stop whimpering as the man got more drunk he became more angry and eventually got up picked up the dog by its hind legs and smashed its head against the fireplace killing it instantly he threw the body into the corner of the room and went back to his beer many many years later people complained that whenever they brought their dogs in here they would never go near the fireplace which by this time had been altered and boarded up the dogs would cry whimper and want to leave the building no one knew why people had their suspicions and then in 1967 when they refurbished the place they took out the old fireplace and to their shock and horror, at the back of the fireplace, they found the skeleton of that very dog that had been killed all those years ago. And people still complain to this day of hearing barking coming from the area around this fireplace. Now, one of the men that haunts the place is a gentleman called 
John Gaunt. And his picture is actually over here on the wall. And it really isn't very often that you actually come up with a real picture of a ghost. There he is. And then another story, his sister apparently still haunts room number three here. And down below, possibly the most scariest, of course, in the cellar, the ghost of Patrick. Let's go down and see if we can find him. I'm uh, coming down the stairs now into what was part of the old cellar. And it really is rather nice to see someone has converted part of the cellar into a cellar bar, actually using it, especially when there's a history. And of course, there's a ghost down here in this cellar bar. They even know his name. His name's Patrick. And he's been seen by lots of people using this cellar bar. Uh, the landlord was telling that someone was actually sitting down here and all of a sudden, for no reason at all, someone tapped him on the shoulder. He turned, but of course there was no one standing there. It must have been Patrick. He's been seen wearing a tricorn hat and an 18th century coat. He's been seen wandering along past the bar and disappears through the wall. Disappears through the wall here at this spot. But there's a very substantial wall here. But I noticed straight away that you can see lines in the brickwork. And in fact, I'm pretty sure that there was once a door there. And if I'm not mistaken, this will be hollow. It is. I just hope that nobody knocks back. But I have a theory that a lot of the ghosts that we actually see are nothing more exciting than a recording. Tragic and traumatic death can often leave a recording in the fabric of a building. The stones, the bricks, the mortar, the woodwork. And then for some reason, it's seen again by people that have an ability, if you like, to see things or hear things. And it's seen in exactly the same position as when that recording was made possibly hundreds of years ago. But of course, the building, as this building, has changed much in the last 300 years. And if it's legless, it's because the floor is now higher than it was when the recording was made. And its feet are actually firmly placed on the old floor, possibly 18 inches lower. If it's headless, it's probably the fact that the ceiling is now lower, and so it cuts the apparition off at the neck. And of course, it just walked through the wall. But did it? Was there once a doorway here? And now the wall's been bricked up, plastered over, wallpaper on top of it, and it appears to be walking through the wall. But of course it isn't. All it's doing is coming through the aperture, the doorway that was once there many hundreds of years ago when Patrick met his death, possibly here in this very cellar. This is the quaint little church of St. Lawrence in Alton, in Hampshire. Lovely old church being highly renovated at the moment. There are not many ghost stories to do with churches because obviously there's not that much death that actually takes place in a church. But this one is very different. This was the scene of a bloody battle in 1643, when royalist soldiers were besieged in the village. They retreated back into this church. 
the round heads surrounded the church and battle took place. They actually forced their way into the church and here, on this very spot, the colonel of the royalists defended himself up here, actually in this pulpit, defending himself with his sword and he actually managed to dispatch six roundhead soldiers from this vantage point up here until he was eventually killed with at least 60 or 70 of his own soldiers that died inside this church. Now on many, many occasions, people say that that bloody battle is reenacted, but not in sight, only in sound. And people say, passing the church, that they can hear the clamor of battle, the clashing of weapons, of swords and pikes, and the firing of muskets. And even to this day, there are still holes, musket ball holes, in the wood of the door of this church. So let's just go over there and have a look at a bit of English Civil War history. And this, the original door of the church here at Alton, and all over it here, you can see holes. These were made by musket balls of Cromwell soldiers. The sound, of course, only is repeated, the sound of the battle, replayed over and over again inside the church and in this very doorway here where I'm standing and all those 70 soldiers are buried just outside in the graveyard in a mound at the end of the churchyard sleeping there for eternity but every now and then their ghosts are reenacting that bloody battle that took place here at Alton in 1643 I'm strolling through a graveyard in the middle of the town of Alton and I'm looking for Sweet F.A. Now I don't mean that in the wrong way, I really am looking for Sweet Fanny Adams. I'm looking for the grave of a young girl called Fanny Adams who was brutally murdered here in a field at Alton in 1867. She was murdered by a solicitor's clerk called Frederick Baker. Her body was then dismembered and parts of her body, after they were later found, were taken to the Leathern Bottle Public House in Amory Street here at Alton. Frederick Baker was caught, tried, and sentenced to be hanged and was one of the last people to be publicly executed in front of the county hall in Winchester. Public executions were in fact abolished in 1868 and this murder of course took place in 1867. This here is the memorial stone dedicated to the memory of Fanny Adams aged eight years and four months, who was cruelly murdered on Saturday, August the 24th, 1867. She, of course, disappeared after she was playing with two friends, and it was days later that her body was found. And it was at the same time that the British Navy had its hardtack taken away from it, and the new bully beef, corned beef, which replaced it. They didn't want to lose their old hard tack. It had disappeared and the sailors soon latched on to the same saying, of course, it was missing. 
just as sweet Fanny Adams was missing. And that is where the saying came from, sweet Fanny Adams. And her ghost has been seen wandering around this graveyard and also in the field where the murder took place. And it's become so famous that they even do a Fanny Adams trail around the town of Alton, searching for the ghost. Now, I'm just outside Eastleigh on the junction of Bournemouth Road and Lee Road um, in, would you believe, yet another haunted phone box. Um, I'd never ever come across one before until we did Erdington. We found one in Oxfordshire and after the Oxfordshire video came out I got an email from a lady that's actually seen that video when she was with her sister. She lives here in Hampshire and she told me of the whereabouts of yet another haunted phone box. This is it. And apparently the phone goes Usually at night, people walking by, and anyone that actually answers the phone, there is someone on the other end with a ghostly message. A message so horrible that no one dare tell it. And I would recommend that if you're walking along Lee Road and you hear the phone go here in this phone box, under no circumstances, would I answer it? So don't you. Luckily, it hasn't rung. Um, and I'm going to leave before it does. This is a very, very haunted stretch of road. And there is another story of a phantom vehicle. But I'll tell you that a little bit farther down the road. And we're now um, driving along the A335 towards Eastleigh. Um, people ask me frequently why, why do we never see modern ghosts? Why are they always old fashioned? And, and I say to them, well of course usually you only know it's a ghost because it's got old fashioned clothes on or it does something strange like disappear through the wall or vaporise or something like that. But there is actually a quite a modern story uh, on this stretch of road here. A number of people driving vehicles along this road towards Eastleigh and they see bright headlights, as, as you would at night of course, coming towards them. Um, very bright headlights on their side of the road. And these folks, of course, swerve, take evasive action. And often accidents have been caused when they've actually turned into um, the curbside, hit vehicles and various other things. But of course, the amazing thing is that whenever they've taken this evasive action, the headlights have come straight towards them and never reached them. They've disappeared beforehand and basically it's believed to be a phantom vehicle that actually was in an accident on this very road some years ago and its last journey is reenacted over and over again and all these folks see are these blazing headlights coming towards them which of course causes more accidents. Hello, my name's Richard Felix, and I'm here at my base at the Old County Jail in the centre of Derby. This place over the last 150 years has been a place of terror, torment, and of course death. 
And that's one of the reasons why this place is as haunted as it is. I've chosen Derby as the catalyst for the national ghost tour of Great Britain. Over the last 10 years, I have taken in excess of 95,000 people on a ghost tour somewhere around the Midlands. And of course, have spoken to many of those people on the tours and of course have realised just how fascinated people are by ghosts. This is the reason that we have chosen to do this tour. The video that you've just watched is a part of that series. But I want your help. If you have a ghost story, then please either email me or write to me at the address that you'll see at the end of this video. Of course, you must remember that after speaking to so many people, I think I have an ability to be able to see through some of the stories, to be able to differentiate between a story that is true or a story that's made up. And of course, you must remember that eight out of ten ghost stories can be explained. But it's the other two that you've got to worry about. I hope you've enjoyed the video. Do sleep well and don't have nightmares.